All right. Hello, everybody. My name is John Martin, and I'll be talking today about using artificial neural networks for offline gravimetry. First, I want to acknowledge and thank my advisor, Dr. Hans-Peter Schaub, for his support in this work. So some, some background. Uh, gravity field modeling is a hot topic these days, especially with increased interest for modeling the fields around irregularly shaped small bodies. There's been a lot of energy and resources spent developing new, new methods and also refining formal models like spherical harmonic representations for the Earth. And as such, it's, it's a rich field with, with many options, but each option seems to have its own disadvantage. Some can be slow to compute, others can diverge at or near the surface of your body, and others assume homogeneous density. Uh, and you wonder why, why isn't there a representation that can do all of these things? And that's, that's a question that I have been interested in for, for a good while now. And as I've kind of scoured the literature for, for explanations or alternatives, I ran across one relatively new approach, and that, that's to use artificial neural networks as a means to represent your gravity field. And I found a collection of papers earlier this year that, that suggested artificial neural networks are actually quite efficient at representing these fields, and they take significantly less time to compute and can maintain relatively low error, which seemed good and encouraging, and I, and I thought it was an interesting idea. But the discussions within those papers didn't answer all of the questions I had. Uh, again, there was, there was this emphasis on the, the computational efficiency of, of using artificial neural networks. But I was curious, and, and a slightly different question is, could artificial neural networks provide a more compact representation of the field as compared to, let's say, spherical harmonic coefficients? Um, that is to say, if you have a, a, an application where you need 1 million spherical harmonic coefficients to achieve the level of accuracy in your application, could you perhaps only need 10,000 free parameters in an artificial neural network to achieve that same level of accuracy? So explicitly, can artificial neural networks provide a more compact representation of the gravity field and its dominant perturbations? That's the question that I wanted to answer that I felt like was missing from some of these, these uh, papers. So to answer that, let's first return to the spherical harmonic basis. Let's remind ourselves where we stand. So it seems about every 10 years, there's an order of magnitude increase to the total number of coefficients used to model Earth's gravity field. We're now talking in, in the millions. And that begs the question, how much are we getting per coefficient? And to, to discuss that at a high level, you'll, you'll see two figures here. On the top right, you have a spherical harmonic model of Earth represented to degree and order two. So this effectively accounts for J2, and that's what you see here. The bottom represents a spherical harmonic model that goes up to degree and order 1,000, which is approximately 1 million coefficients. And you'll notice they don't look all that different. Um, of course, we know that they are different, and those, those coefficients are doing something. So let's, let's see, you know, let's, let's strip the, the J2 and point mass contributions away and see what are the next most dominant gravitational perturbations. And you see here that you see discontinuous features as the dominant perturbations. You see things like the Andes or tectonic shells or the Himalayas. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and rescale this so it's a little bit easier to see these features. But these dominant perturbations arise from discontinuous geologic features. Um, tectonic shelves, mountains, valleys, things like that. And naturally, we want our gravity model to prioritize representing these features. That's technically the next most important thing. So for, for explicitness, if we remove all of the, the background noise, I want a gravity model that can represent these features well consistently. It's worth noting that these features do attenuate at higher altitudes. These are projected at the circumscribing sphere of Earth. Um, if you look at LEO, the features attenuate. We're going to rescale here. Again, clip that mask of features. They're a little bit broader and smoother, but still present. You can still see the Andes and the Himalayas are, are major perturbations. So we return. Spherical harmonics, how well do they represent these dominant perturbations? Beyond J2, how well does the spherical harmonic do? In order to, to investigate this, we subtract 
the true model over on the left from a lower fidelity model on the right. And ideally, if spherical harmonic captures it perfectly, you'd expect the, the difference, the root squared error difference between these two maps to be homogeneous and at zero. These are the two same images, so that's what we see. But let's start with a relatively low fidelity model, degree in order 10 spherical harmonic, which equates to about 100 coefficients. This is what the model produces at that circumscribing sphere. And you see that the error for these dominant perturbations is quite high. So 100 coefficients doesn't cut it. Let's up it an order of magnitude and see how well spherical harmonics captures the features with 1,000 coefficients. You see still relatively high error in these, these dominant areas of perturbation. So one more order of magnitude. Now you're beginning to see the features manifest themselves in the original map, but their errors in those regions are still quite high. So for kicks and giggles, we crank it all the way up to 100,000 coefficients. And now you're getting a map that very closely resembles crown truth. But the places where there is still error are these areas of dominant perturbations. So you're asking yourself, spherical harmonics don't seem to be prioritizing these next most dominant perturbations. Um, and that, that seems uh, not quite problematic, but maybe inefficient. Uh, to look at this in a slightly different light, if we look at the average error of the features clipped in this mask, you get the following curve. This is as you increase the number of total spherical harmonic coefficients, the amount of error goes down uh, by a small margin. Beyond the first you know, 10 to 100 coefficients, your return on investment uh, for increasing number of coefficients just isn't that clear. Likewise, if you, if you take the average error across the entire map, you see a similar trend here on the bottom. So it kind of begs the question, why do we spend so much time acquiring these extra terms and, and why don't spherical harmonics seem to prioritize these features in the first place? And to answer that question, I think there, there are two main reasons for that. The first are that spherical harmonics are really comparing Earth's gravity field to prescribed geometries the spherical harmonics themselves. And those harmonics are periodic and continuous and smooth and well-behaved. And you see that here. And, and for J2, that, that bodes well. When you try and match J2 to one of the, the earlier spherical harmonic terms, there's a decently high correlation between, between those two kind of artifacts. When you look at higher spherical harmonic terms, they do not appear naturally in Earth's gravity field. You do not see mountains in this perfect checkerboard pattern. And as a result, their correlation are orders of magnitude lower than things like J2. So this is to say spherical harmonics doesn't prioritize the features because it's trying to match geometries. And those geometries aren't necessarily natural in the, the gravity field of Earth or other bodies beyond the coarsest coefficients. The other challenge of using the spherical harmonic representation is that harmonic bases struggle in areas of discontinuity. And I think this is best represented through Gibbs phenomenon. If you're trying to, to model a square wave with a Fourier series and you, you see that you need an exponential number of terms in that series to begin suppressing these, these oscillations at the, dis, at the locations of discontinuity. And I think you're seeing the exact same thing manifest themselves with these gravitational features. You have discontinuous regions like mountains and tectonic shelves, and we're suddenly expecting a harmonic periodic basis to model those, those discontinuities well, and that's challenging. It can be done, of course, but it requires many, many coefficients before you smooth and accommodate those features. So that begs the question, can we regress a basis that instead prioritizes features rather than geometries. And that brings us back to the artificial neural network approach. So I'm sure many of you know that the song and dance, artificial neural networks are universal function approximators, uh, assuming you have sufficiently deep or sufficiently wide networks. And they, they work by taking a set of training data, in this case, position vectors, and mapping them to a set of uh, output vectors, uh, in this case, the acceleration. And the neural net updates weights uh, to accommodate an, an optimal nonlinear mapping between that input and output space. And the convenience of this approach is that the basis, the representation of the gravity field is not prescribed. It is not expected to be similar to a spherical harmonic basis. It is instead learned and accommodates the data best it can. 
So this seems like a, a, a decent idea for representing a gravity field. So how do we test it? So specifically, we look at two neural net configurations. The first is a single layer feed forward network, which is to say one layer deep, and its width is, we'll discuss in a moment. And then the other is a deep neural network, which in this case, we've just uh, defined to be three layers deep, and its width will be discussed here shortly. So these are the two network designs we're interested in studying. And we want these to be comparable to the spherical harmonic models themselves. That is to say, we want the approximately the same number of trainable parameters in each of these networks as there are coefficients in a given spherical harmonic fidelity. So in the case of a spherical harmonic that goes up to degree in order 10, there's approximately 100 coefficients. And so we want each of these networks to have about 100 trainable parameters. And what that means is for the single network, we have a width of about 13 in that single layer. And for the deep neural network, we have a width of five. We do similar things for uh, spherical harmonic coefficients that uh, models that go up to, to 1,000 coefficients and 10,000 coefficients respectively. And these are the dimensions of those, those networks. So to train the networks, we sample uh, approximately a quarter million points that are spread uniformly from a zero to five kilometer altitude. And so it's, it's a relatively tight shell around the Earth. The coordinates are pre-processed to, to convert from Cartesian to, to spherical coordinates. We perform a min-max normalization of the inputs and a standard normalization of the outputs. We then perform hyperparameter optimization using Talos. In this case, we use a random search from a user-defined hyperparameter space. And we select the most performant hyperparameters to then compete against the spherical harmonic counterparts. So we've trained all of these networks. And our goal is that these networks reproduce this map as best they can. And the results are uh, a bit disappointing to say the least. So in almost all cases, this, the artificial neural networks aren't acknowledging or even accommodating the gravitational features. You might be able to argue in the case of the, the 10,000 trainable parameters that the neural nets are picking up, features like the Himalayas or the Andes, but I think that that even is a stretch. Uh, looking at this in a slightly different light, we return to this, this 2D plot of the average error and the features and the entire map. And we, wanted the spherical, and we wanted the artificial neural networks to outperform, that is to, to be lower than these spherical harmonic curves. But what you find is when you instead plot the artificial neural networks, they do significantly worse than spherical harmonics. You see that the deep neural networks are better than the shallow networks, but neither outperform spherical harmonics. So what's happened, uh, it seems as though these networks have converged to a, a local minimum based on their loss plots. They've, they've plateaued and they've stopped learning. This could be to a, a collection of different reasons. It's possible that our learning rates were too aggressive, uh, perhaps not enough training data was provided. But altogether, it, it does not seem trivial that these neural networks can accommodate these features efficiently. That is to say, if you're trying to make an argument that artificial neural networks provide a more compact representation of the gravity field than, than spherical harmonics, this evidence suggests probably not. I won't go so far as to say it's impossible. I'm sure someone with, with greater levels of expertise, expertise than myself may have a clever way to accommodate this challenge, but yeah, I, I don't think it can be done trivially. So that's currently where we stand with this work. I, I don't mean to, to call it a closed book. I think there are plenty of other approaches that can be taken. Namely, there's additional feature engineering that can be done. We can train over longer intervals uh, and, and lower learning rates. It's, uh, it seems to have been mentioned that, that when you have sparse features, these longer training times are typically good. So you're not over accommodating too early. Uh, we can also look at higher parameter ranges. We, we restricted our neural nets to only be trainable up to 10,000 parameters, but we could increase that to 100,000 or 1 million parameters. And we still have spherical harmonic models that we can compare against. So it's possible that once your neural net reaches some level of flexibility, it can then outperform spherical harmonics. So there's a kind of another operational regime to, to consider. And then finally, uh, 
I, I don't have much of a knowledge of convolutional neural networks, but I would think that there there is some way to uh, to make use of them as they uh, have an understanding of these these spatial patterns. For instance, you recognize that these features aren't single points on this map. They're typically ridges or or groups of of mountains, and I think a convolutional neural network may be able to better pick up on those patterns than these single layer feed forward or deep neural networks. So plenty of, of other venues and avenues to pursue here, uh, but that's where we currently stand. If you have ideas or feedback, we would love to hear it in the Q&A, but, but until then, that's all I have. So thanks for your time.